morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to today's Enterprise Connect webinar, Beyond Tradition, Why Failing to Evolve Your Conventional Call Center is Costing You Customers, Employees, and Profits. This is sponsored by Twilio and broadcast by Informa. I'm Eric Kraft with Enterprise Connect, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few announcements before we begin. This webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in the Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. Toward the end of our webinar, we'll ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a minute to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. Lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click the Help widget found at the bottom of your screen or type your issue, issue into the Q&A area. And we'll be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. So now on to the presentation. Again, it's beyond tradition. Why failing to evolve your conventional call center is costing you customers, employees, and profits. And our speakers today are going to be Blair Pleasant, President and Principal Analyst at Confusion, and Lenore Files, Senior Product Marketing Manager at Twilio. And actually, before we go to Blair and Lenore, we're going to ask uh, our audience to respond to a poll for us. And we'd like to ask you, what channels does your contact center currently use? Please select all that apply. Uh, so we've got voice, messaging, uh, email, SMS, web chat, and other. Um, and uh, while we're, we'll give we'll give folks a minute to um, uh, to answer the, the questions, and I guess I'll just kind of throw out to Blair and Lenore, maybe in, in a sentence or two, when we say your conventional contact center, what what are we what are we talking about? Well, I, I think what we're talking about is it, not necessarily legacy, you know, on-prem. Um, you know, companies are definitely moving to the cloud. But I think the idea is that a lot of companies are still looking at their contact center as cost centers and not as profit centers. Uh, so not realizing that, you know, the contact center is the front door to the customer and it's really the, the face of the business. So by looking at the contact center, you know, in this light, rather than, you know, looking at it as, you know, just a place where you're throwing your money and not getting much return. Uh, I, I think that's kind of uh, what we're talking about is viewing the contact center differently. Yeah, that's right, uh, Blair. I agree. I think um, um, it's underutilized, right, in that capacity. Um, and, uh, you know, part of that also is extending channels, right? Going, meet the, meeting the customers where they're at. Uh, what they're using in their personal lives. Um, because to your point, um, the contact center is a brand ambassador. Um, it is probably, uh, you know, talks, you know, interacts more with customers on an ongoing basis. So I think it's important um, that those uh, channels be accessible. Um, and um, yeah, that's, it's, you know, moving it more towards uh, a profit center, if you will. Okay, well. Here's here's what our audience is using, and um, I don't know. Are you, either of your either of you surprised? Voice isn't a hundred percent. I am surprised, and unfortunately, we're starting to see that trend a little bit more. Um, where, and, and I'll be talking about that a little bit when we talk about channels. Uh, but it could be that voice is used just not in the traditional way, but um, yeah, I, I really would encourage everybody to, you know, if they're moving digital only, to, to still have voice as a backup. Um, and, and we are going to be talking about that a little bit more when we talk about challenge, um, some of the challenges, channels <laughs> that people are using. Um, and it, it's interesting uh, how many people are using email and um, messaging. You know, email has been around for a while, but messaging is still somewhat new. Um, so the fact that almost 70% um, are using it is, is very, I, I'm impressed with that. Yeah, same here. Right, well, I'll, I'll turn it over to you too to, to 
go on with the presentation. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'll be starting and kicking it off, um, talking about, let's see, can we get the slide forwarded? There we go. <laughs> so, um, so these are the six key topics um, that basically impact your contact center's profitability um, that I'll be talking about and going into more detail about each of these. Uh, so I'm going to provide my take on each of these topics and trends, and Lenore is going to provide um, some specific customer examples to really highlight uh, what businesses are doing and um, things that you can consider going forward to evolve your contact center. So the, the main idea is that with the right platform and tools, your contact center can be a profit center focused on customer satisfaction and loyalty, as well as customer agent experience and retention, which we'll be talking about a lot. You know, we all know, you know, satisfied customers are more likely to purchase or use your service again. So it's important to invest uh, in your contact center to improve the experience for both customers and agents. And, and this includes uh, giving agents the right tools to be more effective and productive and letting customers use their channel of choice and do self-service when appropriate. Uh, and all of this impacts the bottom line and leads to increased profit generation. Uh, so next slide. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is uh, customer experience or you know, CX as a revenue driver, not as a cost driver. You know, we all know by now that superior customer service drives loyalty, uh, which in turn increases sales. You know, we've been talking about that for a long time. You know, there are lots of stats to, to back it up. Uh, there's a recent McKenzie report uh, that points out that you know, while you know, a decade ago, uh, most companies weren't even considering uh, the revenue potential of contact centers for customer service, but today, contact centers can generate you know, lots of revenue. Um, so like credit card companies can generate 25% you know, of new total revenues, uh, and telecom operators can generate up to 60%. Uh, so when contact center agents uh, can solve customer service needs uh, and then segue into uh, the customer's broader needs, customers can be more open and receptive uh, into buying new services and products from them. Um, also, Accenture found that organizations that view their uh, customer service as a value center as opposed to a cost center get 3.5 times the revenue growth. And that's in part because organizations can leverage all of the customer information that they collect, you know, things like preferences and sentiment. And we're gonna be talking about uh, customer data platforms or CDP and how useful all of this information is. And when businesses focus on you know, the customer and CX instead of just trying to reduce costs, they can really improve that customer lifetime value and customer loyalty. Uh, so using information on customer history, customer preferences, and other customer information, you can better connect uh, with, with your customers on their preferred channels and even be proactive when appropriate, uh, which again is going to enhance customer tr uh, trust and loyalty. And uh, so Eric, it's interesting that you asked about you know voice and not all contact centers um, supporting voice. Uh, so the latest poster child for this um, that, that is really viewing uh, contact centers as a cost center is Frontier Air Airlines. I don't know if you've all read about that, but um, you know, last week it was a big thing in the news. In order to cut costs, they just got rid of their voice channel and the ability for the customers to speak to a live agent. So they're basically forcing customers um, to, to interact uh, via web chat, SMS, or social media channels. And, and those channels are great, uh, but the problem is you know, customers are being forced to do that um, and they're not really given a choice. Um, and, and apparently Frontier is even charging to uh, for customers to interact with a live web chat agent to book a flight. So I guess in a way they are, you know, turning their contact center into a revenue driver. Uh, but, you know, as a customer or um, a passenger, if you're stuck at the airport with a missed connection due to, you know, weather or a pilot that got stuck in traffic, which you know, definitely happens, uh, you know, don't expect Frontier to lend an empathetic ear or to let you quickly rebook by talking to an agent. So, you know, of course, I'm all for, you know, using digital channels and um, self-service, uh, but they should be used to improve the customer experience and um, customer loyalty, not to simply cut costs and to frustrate customers. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see the impact of this new strategy. Uh, but you know, being a, a budget airline that you know nickels and dimes passengers, you know that that's been their strategy all along. So I totally understand why Frontier is doing this. Uh, so it it might work for them, uh, but probably for most businesses, that's not necessarily the right strategy. Uh, Lenore, do you want to build on this and talk about some customers? That'd be great. I would love to. Thanks so much, Blair. And that is an interesting story. I did see that. Um, yeah, so um, 
you know, before I'd like to take a step back and just introduce Twilio, uh, you know, because most of you probably know us as CPaaS. Um, but however, we do have CCAS solutions, right, such as Flex, uh, which is our contact center uh, product that does have out-of-the-box capabilities. Um, however, we do approach this as an API-first platform. And so Flex is a, a composable solution, if you will, which means that developers are really free to build and innovate on top of that platform to create unique solutions and experiences uh, for their customers. So, um, you know, Blair, you talk about contact centers, you know, moving from cost center to profit center and the tremendous untapped value, right, that that can deliver to the organization. And I think about Vacasa, a Twilio Flex customer who took user experience really to the next level. So if you're not familiar with Vacasa, they are a leading vacation rental management platform and they offer fully operationally managed homes. So Vacasa encountered a data uh, silo problem and uh, you know, in that booking data and information about their marketing uh, campaigns didn't have, didn't live rather in the same systems, right? They were disparate. And the tools that Vacasa had been relying on to engage with renters and property owners simply weren't able to bring all of that data that they had together in a way that could be understood or actionable in real time, really across all their teams, even their sub teams, right? Within larger groups like support, for example, they were leaving valuable content from each customer experience on the table. So with Twilio Flex uh, in segment, Vacasa was able to you know, bring all of their data together across business silos, making again, that data available and actionable to their frontline teams, right? Uh, like marketing, sales and support, and this was all done in real time. Uh, so for example, Vacasa was able to give data-driven context to their customer facing teams and deliver a completely seamless customer engagement experience, right? In this case, across three different support teams. So, you know, one for owners, one for renters, and one for property managers. And finally, you know, take action, right? Engaging customers with the right message at the right time and over the right channels. Um, and, and that's unique, right, to, 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 to businesses and their customers. Um, so, you know, in fact, productivity was reflected, right, by their bookings increase, you know, of three times over. Uh, so again, extending the digital channels, bringing in uh, the disparate pieces of information about the customers really helped move the needle for Vacasa. All right. Another great example of this is Virtu Motors. I really like this one. This is a car dealership and they're based in the United Kingdom with a significant online presence. But as we know, auto industry, older industry, right? Um, more mature industry, if you will. Um, but they've been facing a lot of pressure from disruptors like Carvana, for example. Um, so what they did is they partnered with Siptex, a Twilio partner, to build a truly game-changing solution built with Flex, Segment, and Spoke Phone. So Segment provides full call context to all Flex and Spoke Phone users. And this allows Virtu, the Virtu team to know why their customers are calling them before they even respond. So for example, if a customer calls into the sales team, the sales team can see who's calling. If they are an existing customer, they will see the details on the car they, they currently own, the value of that car for trade-in together with the last cars they were considering online before they called in. So the Flex implementation supported, uh, supports all channels, if you will, SMS, chat, WhatsApp, Messenger, and email. Uh, SIPTEC's one payment cloud allows Virtu to take PCI payments on all of those channels as well. Uh, they were able to capture clickstream from shopping activity along with complete data on sales, service, and parts records about the customers and prospects. So, you know, as you can see, they have removed, literally removed all the friction, right, from customer engagements, as well as arming their sales folks with the right information to move from just reactive care towards proactive care. Yeah, I, I love those examples. And, and they're such different types of companies, too, because so many uh, people think of Twilio as just being, you know, like digital first or digital only types of um, companies, but you've, you've got, you know, lots of traditional types of companies too. Um, okay, so let's talk about the customer experience because, you know, the focus on CX really sets the stage or is the driver for a lot of the other things we're going to be talking about. Um, so CX, of course, is going to be, you know, even bigger in the coming years. You know, I think you all know the importance of customer experience and I don't need to tell you about it. You know, I've been saying CX is even more popular than Wordle. <laughs> so th the way I look at it is um, customer experience includes personalization, empathy, and channel choice. And it, it really requires knowledge of the customer, their history, their preferences. And getting information on customers is 
actually becoming more of a challenge uh, with website third party cookies going away, you know, especially with, you know, the GDPR rules and Google doing away with third party cookies. Um, so this means that uh, first party data is becoming even more important. Um, and so along with investing in a customer data platform or CDP, um, you know, it's first that first party data is just going to become crucial. So companies really need to be thinking about, you know, different ways to to get the data that they need. Um, and, and Lenore is going to talk about this a little bit more. Uh, but for those of you who you know aren't too familiar with CDP, um, it essentially brings together in a centralized repository uh, customer data that lives in different places to make it uh, more complete and accessible. And, and again, um, Lenore is going to be talking about CDP a bit more. Um, so, Lenore, do you want to talk about a customer example? Yeah, I would love to, yeah. Um, so, I think you've all heard of Nike, right? <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about Nike, which really double clicks on the importance of applying customer context, personalization, and uh, really provides an awesome digital experience, right? It's kind of all the, the, those three things, if you will. So, uh, Nike invested in digital for years on a path where digital channels were going to be roughly 30% of their overall business by 2023. And then during the pandemic, 100% of the retail stores around the world closed, of course, as everything did. Um, and so consumers responded. Consumers started engaging with digital products, both digital commerce products like Nike.com, uh, Nike mobile app, the sneakers mobile app, as well as activity apps like Nike Training Club and Nike Running Club. I didn't even realize those existed, but it sounds great. And so all of a sudden that became the only way they were connecting with their consumers. So uh, given all of this, 35,000 store employees, they call them store athletes, um, that all of a sudden were at home, right? They couldn't come into the stores because the stores were closed. So this is where Twilio played an incredible role, right? To help Nike stay close to consumers. Um, Nike took the Twilio platform and built an application on top uh, where if a, a consumer was shopping on the mobile app and they had a question, they could simply put ask a question and that question gets texted to one of their store athletes who are at that time at home. Um, and the store athletes love serving customers and they like the fact that even though physical stores were closed at that time, they could help digital uh, customers rather by providing insights, right? Advice and education. So it really allowed Nike to, to stay very connected with their consumers. And as a result, digital business just exploded, right? It grew significantly resulting in five times higher sales conversion rates. and you know, now that all physical retail is certainly back open, um, the digital business, it continues to grow. It is not going away. Uh, and store athletes continue to serve not only consumers that are coming back into the stores, but they're also continuing to serve those digital customers. So I encourage you to check that application out. It's it, They're still using it. Okay, let's talk about the agent experience. And what I've been saying is, you know, Agent experience is the new, you know, AX is the new CX. Um, so what we're really seeing now is, you know, it, it goes beyond CX um, to, to really focusing on, you know, that agent experience. You know, you can't have a good customer experience without a good agent um, experience. And, you know, as we've been hearing a lot, you know, happy agents lead to happy customers. Um, so when I talk about the agent experience, I, I focus on uh, three things. So agent empowerment, engagement, and empathy. And we've been talking a lot in the last two years about agents showing empathy for customers. You know, during COVID, you know, the, the big word was, you know, empathy for customers. But it's also important for customers and organizations to show empathy for the agent and for organizations to really understand what the agents are going through. Uh, so a good agent experience requires you know, the right types of um, tools and technologies. But but not too many that you um, overburden uh, the agent. You know, you don't want them to be dealing with tool fatigue. So it's really all about you know the right tools and the right agent interface. You know, having a, a clean single pane of glass that lets the agent um, access the tools and information that they need uh, to have that better agent experience. And, and also, you know, we've all been talking about the great resignation. And even though I think things are going to be slowing down because of the recession, we're still hearing you know quite a bit about you know people resigning um, to do other things and to focus on other things. So we're going to be seeing more and more agent turnover, you know, I think even despite the recession, you know, if, if that happens. Um, and th that's going to lead to higher onboarding and training costs. And in some cases, you know, businesses may even need to increase um, staff salaries in order to 
to meet the right staffing levels. Uh, so what this means is it's going to be increasingly important to pay attention to agent morale and look for ways to keep agents happy and uh, keep them engaged to avoid agent turnover. Lenore? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, agent attrition, you know, obviously, as you mentioned, remains a huge issue, right? It's a it's a cost burden. I think it's the, the most expensive cost burden, right? On contact centers. So I wanted to talk a little bit about a flex customer called Travel Perk. Um, they provide an all-in-one platform for travel, and they're based out of, uh, based in Spain. Uh, they built their own solution with Flex, and we're so excited about it. They actually wrote an article about the process. Um, but the, the problem they needed to solve was, you know, different tools for different channels, voice, chat, email, different tools for context, different tools for action, uh, internal systems, external suppliers, um, and um, that puts a huge burden on the agents, right? Um, when they have these disparate systems, if you will. Um, so here's where the agents really came in uh, and played a big role. After they prototyped with Flex what they wanted in terms of an agent UI, they actually ran focus groups with agents, right? Uh, who helped design and shape the UI and functionality so that that UI and those processes were tailored to, to the agent's specific needs. Um, and they actually voted on the name, the agents did, and they call it Lighthouse. So again, that goes a long way, Blair, to what you're talking about, right? In terms of morale, skin in the game, we're asking agents to do so much more now, but if they don't have the tools to, to, to do it with, then it, you know, it becomes a problem that leads to attrition. All right, um, another great uh, example actually is Shopify. If you're not familiar with them, they're a Canadian multinational e-commerce company and they help small uh, and medium-sized businesses run their online stores. And after experience explosive growth, it was uh, you know clear the company had outgrown its patchwork contact center solution and needed a custom, flexible and scalable uh, solution that they could easily update, right? With, with, with things changing so quickly. Um, they also needed to uh, the ability to move about 90% of their agents to a work from home model. This was prior to the pandemic, by the way. This is the, the, the way that they, they run things. Um, so Chris Wilson, who's a director of technology support, a uh, support technology rather, said that the team realized that Flex provided exactly what they needed to design a custom contact center un unencumbered by the restrictions, you know, plaguing uh, them with their with their legacy provider. Um, they didn't need to go and build their own contact center, right, in house. Uh, they were able to, to get what they wanted with Flex. Um, and, you know, agents are able to easily integrate dozens of supporting applications and software, like Zendesk, for example, and many others, really to create a customizable approach for each customer relationship that they have. Um, you know, for Chris Wilson and his team, the ability to create completely custom solutions and to support their, their agents in that manner is really what, what sold them at the end of the day. I, I love those examples and hearing about how customers or com companies really are focused on the agent experience. Um, so moving on to omnichannel and digital, you know, we've been talking about omnichannel contact centers for years, but it's still taking a while to really get where we want to be. Uh, we are getting closer to, you know, what we mean by omnichannel systems that can monitor and track customers as they move from one channel to another channel throughout their customer journey. Um, and most importantly, where the context from one channel carries over uh, to the next channel. Um, so, you know, as we've been, you know, as most of us know, m most interactions these days do start in a digital channel. Um, you know, it could be web chat, a mobile app, um, and that that's going to continue to increase. You know, especially as businesses do try to push their customers to use digital channels instead of calling into the contact center. Um, so. As much as we talk about omnichannel and digital channels and being digital first with you know, fully integrated digital channels, we, we do have to remember that the phone still has an important role to play, you know, even when digital channels like chat and email are being used more and more. Um, so, so my feeling is that it, it should be digital first, but not necessarily digital only. Um, but you know, again, I, I think you know, as we talked about earlier, I think we are going to be seeing, be seeing more and more, you know, digital only um, moving forward, especially as, you know, we have things like AI and um, intelligent systems that can really um, help customers solve their issues. Um, 
So the thing to, to think about is as new channels are introduced, you know, whether it's, you know, WhatsApp or, you know, TikTok or whatever, you know, the next channel is going to be, it is important to be able to add these channels and provide more choices for customers. So again, the platform that you use needs to be open and flexible so that it can uh, add these new channels. Um, so looking at channel usage, um, next slide. Uh, so web chat and email, you know, are already widely deployed, but but they're still growing. And um, I was really glad to see how many of um, the participants here are using web chat and email because you know those are just so important. Um, so you know, web chat, SMS, and messaging channels are expected to grow the most, but but they also have the low, uh, lowest starting points, uh, and they're still not ubiquitous in contact centers. Uh, telephony self-service, you know, uh, things like you know IVR, are, are still expected to rise quite a bit. Although surprisingly, you know, according to this contact uh, babble study, um, a, a lot of companies uh, plan to reduce their usage of it, uh, which I didn't really quite understand, uh, and, unless they're talking about replacing basic IVR with uh, more user-friendly things like conversational AI for phone service. Um, social media is also seeing a good increase. Um, this generally means uh, messaging channels like, you know, again, Facebook Messenger, uh, Apple Business Chat, WhatsApp, and things like that. So it's really more of these messaging channels rather than social media platforms like Twitter. Uh, the, the issue now is really, you know, how do you get there? Um, do you need to rip and replace what you currently have um, in order to add these new digital channels? So it's important to be able to modernize at your own pace and not be forced to move to the cloud, you know, all at once. Uh, you want to be able to, you know, evolve as you need and uh, be able to add new channels as they come online and um, do this, you know, at your pace without having to change your infrastructure. Uh, Lenore? Yes, absolutely. Um, we see a lot of our customers actually doing just that, um, Blair. They, uh, they keep their um, infrastructure in place, um, they're on premise, and then they add a digital channel or an IBR um, to start to sort of get the benefits of a composable um, contact center, and then they can kind of uh, you know go from there, expand from there. Um, so that brings me to Quintar Andar. Uh, they are the largest digital real estate company in Brazil. Um, they rent houses and apartments in a unique way uh, worldwide. Um, for the tenant, the only need is a credit analysis, and for those who need it, a surety bond, right, a guarantee to rent the property quickly and safely. You know, for the owner, the guarantee that the rent will be in the account. So in Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, they're also they also work in, um, with buying and selling. You know, offering all advantages of quick negotiation without bureaucracy, um, just as they do with their rent. So um, they wanted to centralize everything, right? It was all disparate. They wanted to centralize it on Flex with integration uh, to Zendesk. That's another thing we see a lot of need is to integrate, be able to integrate. Um, and, and they wanted to extend their digital channels, right, to WhatsApp, chat, uh, with voice included, by the way. That's it's very important, right, that to your point, Blair, that um, that uh, that they can get to an agent, right, and actually talk to an agent. So, you know, some of the results were, uh, first of all, it was like three to four months to deploy this. Um, the increased CSAT was up to about 80%. Um, the channel avail availability, rather, went up to 90%. Um, and the SLA increased to more than 13%. So pretty quickly early on, they were able to, to kind of realize a lot of benefits from centralization, integration, and extension of digital channels. All right, uh, let's see. So um, another great example is a Chime actually, um, and they were able to um, integrate uh, digital channels. Um, they could get the customization they were needing, um, and they could, you know, do this by also uh, giving the ability to escalate to an agent. Um, and so, self-service uh, digital channels with the ability to get to an agent, um, which was about uh, a 12, you know, percent increase in satisfaction. Uh, better mortgage, actually, but I'm sorry, a Chime is a uh, digital channel. Uh, sorry, mortgage lender, um, and uh, they wanted to make sure that they were, um, you know, that they were accessible, right, to, to all their customers. So again, the extension of the digital channels with the ability to get to an agent was really key for them. Okay, great examples. 
Um, so of course we have to talk about AI. You know, AI is going to be the hot topic for the next few years. And I, I think organizations are still trying to figure out where and how to use AI. You know, they've been hearing about it, they know it's important, but they don't know where to start or where to get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, so that I think is going to be where uh, a lot of organizations are really going to be focused in uh, the next couple of years is, you know, how do I get started with AI and, um, you know, where's the low hanging fruit? Um, so I, th I think the top applications for the next year for AI are going to be things like uh, personalization, intelligent routing, self-service apps, uh, agent analytics, and also, of course, chatbots. You know, we, we've been seeing chatbots for the past few years. And b based on uh, customers I've spoken with and um, some of the research I've done, I think about 20% of agents will be using AI in some kind of capacity uh, you know, by the end of this year, which is pretty much now, um, and at least 30% uh, by the end of 2023. And again, uh, everyone's talking about AI, but I think it's going to take some time to actually um, get it right. Um, so Eric, I think we have a polling question now. Yes, we do. Uh, and here it is. Uh, are you currently using AI in your contact center? Select one. No, and you have no plans. Yes, you're using it to assist agents. You're using it to assist customers, assist both or not yet, but it's on the roadmap. And again, while we, while we give everyone a little time to answer, um, you know, the, the, uh, the hot news or the hot topic around AI this week has been this um, uh, open AI uh, oh, awesome. tool that, that everybody uses. It, how, you know, the, we've, I've heard a, a lot about that in context of both academics as in students right, using it to write their papers and also coders having some, um, uh, you know, wanting to use it as a resource, but, but you know, wanting to be sure it's accurate. Um, in terms of, a, of what a contact center might think is as, of as a customer service chatbot, when you look at everything that's all the, the talk about that this week, what, what do you all think? I think it's going to add so much to contact centers. And um, I, I think just the knowledge base that it has and the way it can interact naturally. And I, I think it's going to add so much to contact centers if, if they can leverage it. You know, right now it's, you know, open source. I don't know, you know, what, you know, how it's going to be monetized and how organizations are going to be able to use it. But just the information and the knowledge in, in this thing is just mind boggling. Nor what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, there, there's two things, right, that, that we've seen that can make um, that successful, right? The utilization of bots. Um, number one, you know, leveraging AI so that the experience that they have with the bot is a pleasurable one. Um, right. And then being able to get to an agent that has context and that has next best action or information served up logically to that agent, right? So that they can, uh, you know, uh, take that conversation uh, to the next level, and you know, we talked about a cost center to profit center. That's part of that, right? Enabling those agents to 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 achieve that. Well, it was interesting on that. Did I see right on that um, uh, statistics that you had, Blair? The, the very last uh, item in, at the far right was people who interact with contact centers via letter, and only forty one percent don't <laughs> do that. Uh, was it by a letter? I don't know. But uh, fax was also on there, I know. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it, it's, pre it's pretty, well, it, it's amazing. Um, but I, I know um, not too many people use written letters, but sometimes if you want to show document, um, you know, if you want to, you know, share documentation and things like that. Um, and, and fax, I, I know, know in the um, health industry and um, especially, Definitely in the health industry, and I think also in real estate, fax is still used. So yeah, it's interesting how many um, you know, different channels there are, and uh, you know we're also focused on you know the shiny new digital channels. But you know email is, is still very very popular, and um, probably not you know snail mail too much. But um, and and fax we we can't ignore you know again especially in healthcare. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's our results. I don't know. It, it doesn't say how many responses we got in this. It, uh, kind of binary here. Um, actually, it looks like nobody's saying yes at this point, and, and the two different degrees no. So I'll turn that back to Blair and, and Lenore and let you, you both, you know, 
continue. Interesting. Yeah, you know, AI is still relatively new, and um, a lot of organizations, as I said, are still trying to figure it out. Um, so it's, and, and what I've been telling companies is, you know, get your strategy right before just throwing it out there and deploying it because it's, you know, the latest and greatest, and everyone says you have to use AI. So I'm actually glad, you know, when I see low numbers, it means that companies are taking a thoughtful approach. And again, not just throwing out that shiny new object um, because it's the latest trend, but really thinking about how am I going to get the most out of it? So um, so in, in the poll, we did ask about you know using it to assist customers and using it to assist agents. So the way I look at AI is it, it can be customer facing or agent facing. Uh, so I'm seeing more and more use cases or right now for um, customer facing applications. So mostly uh, chatbots for self-service or to help triage and route, route calls. Um, and, and the need for self-service capabilities is really what's driving this. And on the agent facing side, uh, the biggest use of, of AI is going to be for agent assist. So instead of having the agents um, spend time, you know, searching for information and um, you know, trying to find out, you know, searching around, you know, figuring out, you know, how do I, answer this, the bots can be listening in the background and when they hear key phrases or key words, they can access information from a knowledge base or that uh, CDP or you know this new <laughs> AI thing we were talking about um, to give the um, information to the agent. And this is gonna help save time and produce better outcomes. Uh, so AI is really being used behind the scenes to help agents with things like net, uh, next best action and suggested answers. And we're also gonna be seeing things like more robotic process automation or RPA to help with things in the back office. Uh, so things like um, filling out forms or you know, doing some mundane automated tasks in the, in the background. And I, I think you know, a, a little bit more in the future, we'll be seeing more uh, digital and vir virtual assistants helping agents, but that's going to be a, a little more, um, you know, three to four years or so. Uh, so using AI can be one way to turn your contact center um, from a cost center to a profit center. Uh, so again, things like uh, AI tools like um, agent guidance to help augment agents, and providing them with um, uh, suggested um, answers and, and also suggesting ways to cross sell and upsell customers while that uh, the agent is still interacting with the customers. Uh, so my prediction is that there's going to be a lot of false starts and mistakes and user frustration until organizations get it right. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of trial and error. Um, so again, don't rush into deploying AI until you have um, a strategy and a plan. Uh, so one of the biggest drivers uh, for AI is self-service. Um, conversational AI is going to be huge in 2023, uh, replacing touch-tone IVR with more intelligent ways of getting information without having to talk to an agent. So I expect about 10% of customer service requests are, are going to be handled through um, conversational AI agents, um, you know, pretty much for the next few months. And I think by the end of 2023, it'll be going up to about uh, 15 to 20%. And with conversational AI, uh, customers calling into a company can really just talk naturally and <coughs> Sorry, they, they don't have to deal with you know stupid IVR prompts and you know press one for this and press two for that, and they can get the information that they need you know twenty four seven without having to talk to an agent. And customers really like self service options you know because it lowers costs, um, or sorry, contact centers like using these options because it lowers costs. I know as Lenore mentioned, uh, the biggest costs in contact centers are agents. So when AI and bots can handle. Uh, the basic questions and interactions like, you know, when is my package going to arrive and, you know, uh, what are your operating hours? Uh, so doing these things through self-service and using AI can really um, save live agents for, for more uh, complex interactions and those uh, interactions that require empathy. Uh, so, you know, customers like self-service because they can get the information and do uh, transactions, you know, 24-7 and contact center agents uh, or contact centers like it because it lowers costs. So it really is a win-win and we're going to be seeing you know, a, a big increase in not just self-service, but in intelligent self-service using conversational AI. So digital engagement is really the next frontier and um, can, can include things like um, digital self-service capabilities as well as digital assisted self-service. 
So what I mean by digital self-service are things like uh, digital or intelligent virtual assistants, uh, intelligent and automated chatbots, and proactive notifications like uh, text message notifications to help avoid that, the need for customers to reach out to a contact center. Um, also, it's about enhancing customer uh, websites with intelligent, uh, interactive capabilities that are really going to reduce or even eliminate uh, the, the need for live agent interactions. So I think in, in the next year or two, uh, we're going to start seeing more uh, proactive interactions uh, that can ant anticipate when a customer may need to support and um, or, or when a customer may need support and um, le letting the system reach out before the customer has to reach out to you. Uh, so it could be based on things like seeing a customer um, having a problem uh, doing something like filling out a form or, on your website, or if they leave a shopping cart before finalizing the purchase. Uh, it could be as simple as offering a customer a callback um, when they have a problem, or popping up a, a web chat interaction, or uh, sending an SMS when there's an outage, um, or sending an SMS when uh, there's a flight change. Um, you know, anything that customers need to be notified about. So it's really all about being proactive uh, so that you can increase your sales by reducing uh, the number of abandoned sales uh, shopping carts, for example. Uh, Lenore, do you have examples about this? Yeah, so <clears throat> obviously we've seen uh, a lot of our customers, right, implement self-service. Um, to your point, automating from the edges in, so freeing up those agents for the very important, you know, voice uh, calls or even uh, chatting with an agent directly, right, uh, off, off the website. So, you know, a good uh, uh, one of the good examples I wanted to share is Cover. It's an insurance company, another established industry, if you will. Um, so with, with Cover, if you want to quote, all you need to do is fill out information online or in their app, and you're going to receive an automated quote over text. Uh, and that'll include a, a prompt that if you do want to talk to an agent for specific details, you just have to text right back and you'll engage with an agent. Um, so, you know, engagement is about seven percentage points higher uh, now than before they implemented that ability. Um, but I think what it also did for them is it it, it reduced the, the back and forth, right? Um, that self-service ability um, it, it is very um, pleasing. You know, most of us do want self-service, right? Where it makes sense to, with the ability to, to talk to an agent if we need to. Um, so I guess, you know, Blair, the point here is, is what you've been saying is um, a great self-service service experience, but again, with the ability to get to an agent right quickly when needed. And that's really the key, I think. Uh, where, you know, that's where we see success, right? Customers have success. Um, you know, an, another a great example is Lemonade, right? Um, as we talk about a digital first strategy, um, you know, Lemonade is billed as an insurance for the 21st century. Um, and they are definitely disrupting the space, right? Which again is a mature industry. Um, and they're doing this by deploying a mobile first and digital first approach, not only, but first, right? I know Blair, you had mentioned that. Um, you know, there are a lot of upfront questions that agents need, uh, which can be uh, delivered right over text or web. For example, if somebody files a claim, the agent would wanna be able to collect a lot of those uh, upfront questions um, and, and get into those details of the situation before connecting live, right, with the agent, right, to maximize time and, and productivity. So um, they started with a chat bot they named Maya, and um, what they did do is they, again, added that live agent backup in SMS. So get the details uh, digitally, you know, over those channels uh, to the agent with the ability to get to the agent when needed. Um, and it really quickened the whole um, process. So um, as you can see, it was a, a, a low commitment, right, in terms of implementation perspective um, with a big impact, right, to both the agents and the customers. Um, and again, this is, you know, Lemonade's a great example of experimenting, right? Starting small, the solution proves itself and earns its way to additional investment. And we do see this, right, with, with a lot of our customers you know, approaching it this way. Blair, I know you, you talked about augmentation, migrating at your own pace. That is another approach that we see a lot, right? Uh, adding a digital channel, dropping in an IVR, and then uh, kind of proving it out, out from there. So these are all ways 
that, um, I mean, the door shouldn't be closed on any business, meaning that even if you have a legacy system, you still have the ability, right, to, to begin that modernization, if you will, you know, to begin to, to move your engagement, right? Um, getting that reactive care solid and amazing as you move towards proactive, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and again, we do see a lot of that with our customers. Yeah, and I love these use cases because it, it is hard for organizations to figure out, you know, how do I get started? So, you know, these are great use cases and, and the idea of, you know, start small, you know, don't just, you know, you know, try to boil the ocean and just throw AI out there for everything. So it's really identifying, you know, what makes sense for my organization and, you know, how, how can I get started and then grow from there? Um, so the last topic we're going to talk about is um, expanding customer care responsibility beyond the contact center to the entire enterprise. Uh, you know, contact center technology can be used not just by, you know, the formal contact center agents, but by knowledge workers or, you know, what we call informal agents in uh, different groups and departments, and even back office workers and people working in uh, branches or retail locations. And this really uh, spreads the responsibility of customer relationships and customer service across the enterprise uh, to the appropriate people and um, to the right work groups. So the idea is that anyone with expertise can be connected to customers and have conversations and anyone who's customer facing can provide customer support in various ways. Uh, you know, for example, we saw during COVID uh, when people weren't going to retail stores like what Nike um, experienced, uh, that people working in the stores, you know, were, were still able to take calls and help customers because, you know, they weren't dealing with people, you know, in person, but they, you know, had all this time to be able to take calls and, um, you know, have um, interactions routed to them. And and some retailers are still using this model, you know, and I love the example um, about Nike and their, um, you know, how they're leveraging people. Um, so, and, and the same is true for uh, bank branches and other types of businesses. So leveraging people, you know, in different parts of the organization in different locations to really um, connect with customers and provide that um, needed customer service. But this means that, you know, they need to have the right tools. Um, so um, they, they have to have the right tools and technologies to help, to help them help customers uh, regardless of their role. And, and really these non-contact center agents need to be able to access the same customer information and the same data to help customers access, um, or to help customers solve their problems. So it's important to provide access to customer data uh, via CDP and things like that uh, to help give them uh, the information that they need to paint a full picture of the customer. So I think that's it and it's time for Q&A. And I did see some questions come in. Yes, it is. It's it's time for Q and A. Thanks very much, Blair. One of our great, great stories, great um, data. Um, uh, really, I think gave us gave us a really terrific look at at how you can move off of that that traditional or or uh, sort of old school call center. Uh, and tons of examples. So I want to ask, um, and I, I want to remind everybody, of course, to go ahead and use the, the Q&A interface to uh, to ask your questions. Uh, we, we've uh, got got a little bit of time here, so we'll, uh, we should have, have time to respond. Um, and the first question, um, it's phrased as, how do you turn anecdotal stories into quantifiable ROI? And I guess I want to kind of add to it, not just he, the, the, this person mentions quantifiable story or anecdotal stories, but um, talking about quantifiable ROI, a lot of the improvements that that uh, Lenore you showed in your use cases, they had to do with things like customer satisfaction, um, channel availability, um, and and how are so how are contact centers today thinking about the ROI of metrics like improved customer satisfaction? Yeah, I mean, um, you know, obviously there are traditional methods of average hold and handle time and you know things that we all know and love with contact centers. But to be honest with you, we're seeing a shift kind of not away from that, but a shift on um, engagement, um, frictionless journeys, um, you know, removing that friction, um, making it um you know, really easy, right, for for those for those uh, customers to engage with you. I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, customer lifetime value. 
that's like big. You know, we have a lot of customers really double down and focused on that. And part of that is the agent experience, right? That's a big part of it. Making sure the agents have their tools, uh, making sure they have contextual information so that they can personalize, um, so that they can become more proactive, understanding where those customers were on their website, what their click streams look like. So not that the not that the tried and true are going away. Um, and I do, by the way, I can point you to stories. We've of everything I talked about today, there is a written story uh, that would, you know, maybe double click a little bit more. And some of them do have more traditional um, ROI, which I'm happy to share with you. Um, but we really see, you know, more around um, NPS uh, lifetime value. It's much less expensive, right, to 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 keep a, a customer than acquire them. So um, that's what we're seeing with our customers. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Is it's it's really about you know that customer lifetime value. Uh, you know, we've all read you know how much. You know, it, it costs so much less to keep a customer than to get a new customer. Uh, and that lifetime value really d does play an important role. Um, I, I think other things to look at are, you know, um, being able to do some cross-selling and upselling with some of these examples. So I, I think without some of these tools, um, these organizations weren't necessarily able to get more sales per customer or um, get more revenue per customer. So I, I think every organization needs to think about, you know, what are my goals and, and how do I, what am I trying to accomplish? So is it, you know, increasing sales? Is it reducing costs? Is it increasing customer lifetime value? So the ROI is really going to depend on, you know, what are your goals and what are you trying to accomplish? And that's going to be different for everybody. Um, so I, I think by identifying what your goals are, then you can think more about, you know, am I going to be able to achieve my goals by, you know, deploying some of these technologies and by um, using some of these new capabilities. Got it. Okay. All right. We have another question here, uh, Lenore. In a lot of those use cases you mentioned, uh, you talked about customization with Twilio, and customization has been in the premises legacy world a big factor in making it harder to to migrate. Um, so when when Twilio talks about customization, um, what does that look like to the enterprise? How how difficult is it to to do that customization? Do you use your own developers? Do you, uh, uh, Twilio famous is famous for you know your developer orientation. What how does that sort of help um, uh, help enterprises do this kind of customization? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and you know, n most of the examples I shared with you, and most of our customers don't have developers um, in house, right? We have a, lo a lot of low code, no code options. We have a huge ecosystem, right? We have partners that will uh, take, you know, do the heavy lifting, um, do all of that coding or customization, if you will, um, to be able to design the system that you're looking for. But you know. That's the whole point of a composable uh, solution is that you can quickly and easily add digital channels, integrations into Zendesk, for example, or Salesforce. That's another really big integration we see, right? Um, it doesn't take lots of hours of professional services and lots of money as we, all of us know from you know, the legacy day, the, the on-premise days, it was quite expensive to make those um, those changes. So that's the, the super upside of this, right, is, um, Blair just mentioned, you know, each business is unique. Each, you know, the customers are unique, right? To, to you know, to, to that business. And this allows you uh, to tailor those experiences. Um, and uh, then you couple in the, the um, you know, pulling together of all the, the, the customer data, uh, not just for the C, from the CRM, but all of the data sources, the disparate ones throughout the organization, you know, providing that contextual uh, information, feeding that to the agent in a way that's digestible, where they can take action on it, um, it, it is is all happens, you know, through um, through um, customization and uh, being able to design. You know, at the end of the day, it's like uh, a couple of our I think a couple of our customers have said this. I think Chris Wilson did at Shopify that, you know, rather than um, the technology determine what the CX strategy is. It's the opposite, right? Your CX strategy, uh, you determine that, 
And then uh, Twilio supports that and allows you to, to kind of realize that, uh, that strategy. Blair? I mean, every system is going to require customization, you know, whether it's, you know, one of the traditional contact center providers or, you know, some, a company like Twilio, you know, ev everything is going to require customization. Uh, so whether it's professional services or developers, you know, th there's very, very few, you know, maybe for, you know, uh, an SMB, you know, maybe they can do something out of the box, but it's, it's very rare. Um, so I, I think the, the key is to have the right tools for people to be able to do this customization um, so that it's not, you know, too painful. And uh, so whether it's, you know, tools that Twilio provides or professional services organizations that do some of the work for you. I, I know Twilio works with uh, Waterfield and some other companies that will do, you know, these customizations and integrations and everything um, so that uh, the organization doesn't have to do it. There are partners that do it also. So you don't necessarily have to have a team of developers. You know, there are, there are other um, businesses that um, and partners that can do this for you to make it easier. So you can have something as customized as you need um, to, to really get the results that you want. Okay. And I, I just want to, we've got a couple minutes, I think enough time for one more thing. I want to, I want to um, go back to the, the, one of the last slides, Lenore, that, that you presented on Lemonade and the, the quote uh, from the, uh, I believe it would be the, the agent who said, I feel like I was born for this. And I wonder if, you know, we, um, you mentioned it took just two developers uh, to, to do it. Was I, is there, is there any more information you can kind of share about, was that kind of a specific uh, uh, effort to, to improve the agent experience or, you know, kind of how, how sort of universal is it among your customers that an element of what they want to do as they upgrade their contact centers is, you know, create that feeling in their agents? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that um, there is a large percentage that do recognize um, the, you know, the incredible importance of the agents and the uh, the pressure, right? That 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 you know what we expect out of them, um, and traditionally the, the lack of tools, um, and so they do go into it perhaps with um, the goal of designing, uh, working with the agents to design uh, the right you know UI and the right experience for them. In other cases, Eric, you know, um, you know, some of our customers go into it like, you know what, I'm going to add a couple of digital channels, I'm going to add an IVR, I'm going to test this out, and then, you know, over time, they begin to see the benefits, and then they begin to see, oh, we can actually, you know, with with it with the with a single UI, single pane of glass that's completely customizable. Wow, we can actually like, you know, make our agents rock stars, right, and give them all the tools that they need at their fingertips. So that can happen over time. That may not be right away. They may not go into it right with that with that goal per se. But um, I think I had mentioned, you know, they uh, sometimes they go into it, you know, small. They start small, uh, and uh, they realize the benefits from that, and they start to grow, sort of proof of concept, and it starts to really take off within the organization. So we we see both. All right, Blair, any. Any closing thoughts on agent experience? I'm just so glad to see that it's finally a focus. And, uh, you know, organized organizations are really recognizing, you know, again, agents aren't just a cost, but they're really a value. And, you know, they're the front door, the ambassadors, you know, the, the brand champions. So investing in agents as much as you can, I think is just so important. And that's really what's going to give you that ROI and that bang for the buck. Um, and, and not just looking at agents as, you know, low cost workers that are, you know, just sitting in this, you know, dank room, you know, answering call after call all day, but they're really the ones who are going to, you know, help your organization succeed. Because if customers have a, a bad experience with, um, with your organization and with customer service, they may not come back. So really giving agents the right tools to have them informed and knowledgeable so that they can solve your customers' issues and you know, present that in you know, an empathetic way and in a you know, friendly, personalized way. I think that's really what's going to give organizations that um, ROI and really um, help them succeed. Perfect. All right. Well, 
that takes us to the top of the hour and the end of our event. I um, uh, want to thank, again, Blair and Lenore for just a great conversation and a great uh, amount of information that you shared and very insightful. Thanks to Twilio for sponsoring. And, of course, everyone in the audience, thanks for attending. Um, in the next 24 hours, you'll get a personalized follow-up email that will have uh, details or a link to this session, which uh, we encourage you to share with uh, your colleagues who uh, would also get uh, as much out of it as you did. Um, and uh, this copy, this webinar is copyrighted by Informa. Uh, the presentation materials are owned by or copyrighted by Enterprise Connect and Twilio. And the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and their opinions. So on behalf of our guests, Blair Pleasant and Lenore Files, I'm Eric Kraft. Thanks for your time and have a great day. Thank you.